Okay, grab your Bibles with me. We're going to continue. Turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 32. We have been through, uh, been ministering on the subject, the four faces of the spirit-filled man. And uh, we're, we're beginning this morning on the face of the evil. Uh, if you look in Ezekiel chapter 1, the Bible says that God showed Ezekiel uh, what most people think are cherubim angels. And they have four faces, the face of an oxen, the face of a man, the face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. And uh, the face of the oxen is, uh, what is it? Capacity. Yeah, just went right out of my head. The face of the man is your flesh. You're going to deal with your humanity until the day you die in one form or another. Uh, the face of the lion is the fighter in you, the warrior in you. You're going to need that. The face of the eagle, though, is a type of loyalty, selflessness, discipling, and our responsibility to other people. Probably, you know, in studying this, it just amazes me how God misses nothing. And, and I think I'll tell you something. So I know I've said this before. I want to say it again. That if you live to yourself, you are going to be of all men most miserable. If the only person you're worried about is you, if you never pour your life into anybody else, you're going to be of all men most miserable. There are times, this is the honest to God truth, there are times in my life when, when I'm emotionally down, this is what crosses my mind. I need, I'm not lying. God knows whether I'm telling the truth. I need to find something to do for somebody because i got to get my mind off of myself. Yeah. And I'll tell you something. There, that's where uh, so much joy and peace is. Of all the animals, the, the three animals that God says there's certain characteristics of them that are going to have to be in us. They're going to have to be in us. The eagle by far is the one Eagles are aggressive parents. They are probably some of the most aggressive parenting animals in all of nature. And uh, I'll tell you, something, I've just been amazed in studying these uh, these different animals that we've been talking about. And we're talking about how that there are these these qualities of these animals that God uses. Uh, someday, literally, when you and I get to heaven, we will see these creatures one day when we're in heaven. We, they will actually worship next to us or somewhere beside us or, yeah. and, as, and as strange as they may look those things were an eternal reminder to you and I listen at some point in your life you're going to have to find an avenue to minister to people if, if you do not listen if you do not learn to minister the gifts and the true call and the reason you were born will never manifest it will never ever ever manifest until you decide to find where God wants you to serve. I want to just say some things. Uh, I just want to say this because it's been on my heart since we got home. We're going to relaunch some things in this church, particularly surrounding children's ministry, uh, because we're not reaching. We're not reaching kids. We're not reaching young people. We're not. Listen, it used to be on Wednesday night that. But uh, between youth and, and all of the children's ministry, we used to have like 40 kids from little kids up to teens. Now we might have 15. And I'll tell you something, some of you have stopped coming to church on Wednesday night. If you're a dad, you need to drag your family to the house of God on Wednesday night. Listen, when you say, well, we're here on Sundays, I'm going to tell you something. My, daughter, my oldest daughter uh, used to say this, she used to say, my favorite service of the entire week is Wednesday night. And I'll tell you something, uh, if you were here Wednesday night, I'm telling you, Pastor Shane preached an awesome word. And I know people say, well, you know, I'm tired. Go get, I'm tired. I'm, I'm more tired than you are. I, I promise you, I'm more tired than you are. But I'm telling you something, the house of God is important. You need to get your little boy and your little girl and your sons and your daughters. They need to be in the house of God on Wednesday nights. They really do. You need to make it a part of your life. You need to make it a part of your life. And so we're going to be relaunching some things. I need to get together with the eldership and with Sarah and Betty. And, and we need to talk because there's a fire been put in some of our men's hearts. And do you know, listen to this statistic this man said. If a, if a teenager in a family gets saved, he will affect 4% of that family. If a woman gets saved, she will affect 19% 
of that family. If a man gets saved, come on. If a man gets saved, come on. If a man gets saved, come on. preached on this this morning, but there's got to be a resurrection of man. I'll tell you something, my heart was awakened. I'm always amazed at how blind you can go when you think you're seeing. Yeah. And uh, I, I responded to an altar call yesterday that I cried so hard I had a headache. I mean, I just, I just cried so hard I had a headache. And I don't get headaches, but I cried, and I, I cried, I started crying before he ever gave the altar call. I was messed up. And I'll tell you, this, this thing God, this thing God put in me, He said, uh, you're a man. You're a man of God. You have my ear. You have authority. And you know, it's easy to forget that. And you start getting this in this mindset that Satan has more power than you do over your family and over your circumstances and all that. And God had to remind me that that's not true. You see, I've got... I've got a child. You all know this, and I went to uh, John, or John Menzik, and and Victor. You, you, that was not accidental. What you guys did at men's conference, because that was on my heart. I'm praying that by next year, my son is saved and Holy Ghost filled. Yeah. And just made it and I'll tell you something. I had forgotten that I have power. And I just been telling the devil, you get your nasty hands off of my child. Amen. You get your nasty hands off of my child. I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters, we need to understand that. Man, I, I would encourage you, uh, and I, and I want to say this, uh, you know, I know some people think, oh, you know, you're just all fired up, you're just on a high, that's fine, yeah. Well, I just, let me stay high as long as I can stay high. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I, I'm just going to stay on it as long as, and you need to as well. But I want to I look at uh, the face of the eagle, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spreads his wings and caught them and carried them on his pinions. Father, we just come before you this morning. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to get back to this. I used to do this all the time. And you say, well, you're just copying this guy. I am. I'm copying him. So just bear with me. You know, he said, you know, did this just hit my spirit? He had to stand for the reading of the word, and I used to do that for years. I used to do that, and I'm just going to start doing it again because yeah. we need to honor the word of God. Yeah. Father, we just come before you this morning. We ask this morning, God, I pray that no heart would would be the same when we leave here this morning. I pray that Holy Spirit, you do what only you can do. Do in my heart. Do in everybody else's heart in this house. But only you can do it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I want to talk about uh, the eagle. They are uh, the male and female eagle. They are some of the only animals in the animal kingdom that mate, mate for life. The same male, the same female will spend their life together. The eagle is a type of loyalty. It's something that you and I have watched our culture lose. It's no longer important whether you stay with your spouse. It's no longer important whether you are loyal to your family, whether you're loyal to your marriage, whether you're loyal to your church, whether you're loyal to your leadership. It doesn't matter. America has lost its sense of loyalty. There's not even loyalty. Listen, I'm bring some, there's not even loyalty in business. It's all about where I can get something the cheapest. There's, not, there's no sense of loyalty in America. But, it, but I'm going to tell you, God is unchanging. God is unchanging. Uh, we were, I don't know who we were, we were, I don't know if I was listening to this or whatever, uh, but there was the, they put on the news, this, this man and his wife, they had been married for 72 years. The wife got sick and she was dying, and the husband ended up being put in the same hospital. And he asked the doctors, he said, would you please put me in the room with my wife. And they held hands until they died together. Married 72 years. Now I'm going to tell you something. Listen, 
David said this, and you have to pray this a lot of times in your life. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. Yeah. Yeah. Renew. You know how many times I've had to pray that as the pastor of this church? Renew a steadfast spirit in me. Yeah. You have to pray that over marriage. Renew a steadfast spirit. Renew in me a spirit that I'm going to stand and I'm going to believe you for the promises you've given me. Yeah. I was reminded last night in prayer, God said, Randy, I told you that if you would be obedient to me in private, that there would never be an auditorium big enough for the people I would send you. If you will, if you will honor me in the private place, I'll honor you in the public place. in the public place. I've been trying to say something. God had to remind me of who I am in Christ. God has to remind us of who we are the head and not the tail. We are, this is what I'm we are above and not under. Come on. The man and the, the, not the man, the male and the female eagle, they are all about the nest. Their life is about the nest. And I, when I first started studying the eagle, I thought, you know, I'll probably be able to cover the face of the eagle in one Sunday. And now I don't know if I'll cover it in five. There's so much to be said here. You see, I'm going to tell you something. See, their, their whole life is about building an environment where they can raise other eagles. That's what they live for. Their whole life. That's their whole life. Their whole life is building an environment that's pictured by the nest where we can raise other eagles. That's the church. The church should be a place. It's an environment that's formed, that's prayed over, that's built in the spirit, that takes time and you protect it. And its whole purpose, its whole purpose, been the cry of my heart my whole life to build passionate scary men of God Amen. this man I'm just I'm not gonna go on about but he did something I had somebody came to me the other day and they said they had talked to somebody that used to attend here they were talking about me and they said yeah I heard he's got pretty wild Walking on chairs, <laughs> kicking down music stands. Well, this guy, he brought this table out. And he, because this is what he said about men. He said, men have been reduced to a remote control, a golf club, and a video game. That's men of our culture. We're running from being parents and grandparents. We're running from what we were supposed to be, which is walking with our grandsons and our sons and telling them and showing them what it is to be a man of God. And he puts all of this stuff, a computer, a real computer, it was a real laptop. And he puts it all on this table, this horrified Josh. Josh is a computer guy. He was sitting next to me and he goes, what did you say, Josh? I can fix that screen. Yeah, he said, I, I, Josh was sitting after this pastor did it. Josh goes, he was sitting right next to me. And he goes, I can fix that screen. <laughs> anyway, he put all this stuff. And he's talking about Jesus turning the tables over. Talking about how Jesus was not a barbershop beauty. Oh, that's right. nope. Jesus yeah. was a man's man. Yeah. Jesus was a powerful man. And he steps behind this table and he said, it's about time somebody turns the tables over and everything went flying. The computer went flying. The golf club went flying. The video games went flying. Everything, everything went flying. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. It is about time we become men and women of the nest. That is, I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. So, what was the nest is an environment. 
If you hear that we as leadership in this house will not tolerate people that cause trouble, that cause discord, that gossip, and you hear, you say, do you know they kicked them out? You better believe we did. <laughs> and the will kick you out. Because this place is about building eagles. Yeah. This place is to be a protected environment. Every leader in this house should be committed to one thing. We're building a nest Amen. where it is a protected environment for we raise Hallelujah! We raise eagles! We raise eagles! We're not here to pet the devil. We're here to create an environment that God can move in. Now I'm going to tell you something. This was all pre-conference. The conference just added a little bit to it. But this has been stirring in my heart. I was excited on the way down the conference. I was excited about this morning. I was excited to preach this to you. Listen to this. I want to talk about where they put the nest. They put the nest far above. See, the first thing that we need to teach people is their identity. Your identity is not beneath your identity is not what happened to you. Listen, I'm going to tell you, your identity is not molested. Your identity is not a rip-off. Your, your identity is not a homosexual. Your identity is not a pornographer. Your identity is not a priest. Your identity is not a Her <laughs> identity. I'll tell you something. So, I'm going to embarrass you, Rose. But Rose went through a situation, going through one, where somebody that harmed her is now something she has to face lately. And I was telling her Wednesday night, I said, don't you ever give that thing power over your life. <laughs> That is in the past. Yes. Come on, sister. That thing is in the past. Yes. That, that's not who you are. You are a blood-bought child of God. Yes. You're not that. Yes. God doesn't see you as that. I don't care what that is. I'll tell you, the power of the gospel can break any chain. It can, it can transform any person. It can do anything. This man that preached that my, 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 my father was an alcoholic and divorced his wife. My grandfather was an alcoholic and divorced his wife. And he said, and so I was purposely trying to ruin my marriage. I figured it was going to happen anyway. And he said, and then I went to a promise keeper's. And he said, I encountered Jesus in my life. And he said, I went home and listened to this for three hours. He said, I knelt before my wife in the kitchen for three solid hours and I repented to her. And he said, you give me time and I'm going to turn this home around. You give me time and I'll prove to you I'm not the same man. You give me time and I'll repair all of the wounds. You give me time and I'll change our family. And I'll tell you something, that, God is, that man now pastors the largest assemblies of God in the United States. He's Hispanic. Well, he's actually Puerto Rican. But he, but he claims kind of being Hispanic. He said that Hispanic stands for we're his and we're going to create a panic. <laughs> I'll tell you something, church. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to create an environment where you know who you are. On, if any man be in Christ. Secondly, 
The environment is to be one of moral purity. Yes. There has to be moral purity. Listen, brothers, listen to this. So, so Manoah and his wife, these are Samson's parents. They have, they can't, she can't get pregnant. She has an encounter with God, and God says this to her. God says to her and her husband, He says, I don't want you to drink any alcohol. I don't want you to eat anything of the vine. There's people I don't want you to go around, and there's there's and, and I don't want you to go around any dead person. And it's before he's ever born. You see, God needed a clean womb. God was saying, I want a clean womb. I want a clean nest. I'm going to tell you something. You want to talk, you say, well, those people are Nazis. You better believe it. We're going to have a pure nest. Because if you're going to raise up Samson's, you better have a pure nest. I'm talking about moral purity. Listen, I've watched parents that can't make the connection between their child's problem and what they allow in their life. Hear me? Come on. I know parents that can't make the connection between their child being bound and there's things they won't stop doing. Amen. And I'll tell you what, God will make that connection. God makes that connect. God made that connection with me. He said, you stop that. Or I'll stop working in your life. And I'll tell you, the longer you serve God, the more nitty-gritty he'll get about that. You better stop talking to your wife that way. Yes. You ever, anybody ever had a good, listen, I don't know about you, I was spanked when I grew up. I didn't, my parents didn't know anything about this well give them a time out <laughs> my only time out is when I passed out from fear <laughs> my dad would, would, would tell you you go grab a switch yeah. anybody come on anybody remember the switches <laughs> see I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I'm a believer but there's sometimes that's the only thing a kid understands my, my kids will tell you that I got a certain look on my face and when that look came on my face, they knew that it was over. You had better pipe down and shut up and stop what you're doing or I'll beat you right here. Yeah. We're, in a, we're in, a, in a store in Spokane. Amanda, God bless you, Dwayne. <laughs> Amanda, she was throwing a fit in the store. And I said, Amanda, you don't knock up and spank you right here. I don't think she, I, don't, I think she thought I was fibbing. And right there, right there in the grocery store for everybody, I spanked your butt right there. I'm not talking about Pat. I mean, I spanked your butt right there. Some teenagers were watching. One of them goes, did you see that? I'm going to call the cops. <laughs> now, go ahead. Because either I'll deal with her or the cops one day will have to. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. We're going to have a nest of moral purity. <coughs> Now listen, I'm just going to say something to you. We take strong stands. Want to know why? Because we want the power, the convicting power yes. of the... Listen, we're beyond the point. We are beyond the point of nice sermons, tickling people in the church. And I'll tell you, if that's the way you get them, you won't keep them that way. What they need is sticking power. They need a confrontation with the power of the Holy Ghost Himself. And that is why we have more in this place. If you're a leader, that's the deal. Yeah. Right. If you want to leave this house, I'm just saying, you cannot drink. If you want to leave this house, there's places you cannot go. If you want to leave this house, there's things you cannot do. That's the difference between those that lead and those that follow. Come on. I don't know about you, but I'm in it forever. I'm in it one day. I have to stand before God for who I've been and what I've been about. Come on. Say amen or all amen. With your sons and your daughters, I'm just going to say this. I was sitting behind. I was sitting in the second row and I was watching some of our Timothy house guys. I was watching Cash while this man was preaching. And to me anyway, Cash was glued. You know what this man said? He said, men will not follow a passive leader. That's right. If you're going to be passive about the things of God, you're not going to get anybody to follow you. That's not why you should be on fire, but men will not, pa will not follow a passive leader. 
Well, you know what? Because we're not women. We're men. There's something about a man. There's sometimes, you know why men, I think, don't generally give each other as bad a time as women do? Because a man knows if I push another man too far, he might punch me. <laughs> and, and, and listen, we know. My dad told me, my dad said, don't you misunderstand little guys. Sure. So sometimes a little guy has more in it because he's angry. Oh, yeah. You better be careful what you're awakening. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I'll tell you something. See, there's sometimes that men only understand. I, I don't know, growing up, I don't know, at 15, I must have been, I was, I was probably huge at 15. I probably was at least five foot two, and, and I must have weighed at least 120 pounds. I mean, and, and solid muscle. You know, I'm joking. You know, I'm joking, obviously. But I was going to stand up to my dad. I was going to tell my dad the what for. And you know, what my dad did. My dad did not counsel me. He did not say, "Now, Randy, you need to calm down." You know, what he did. He punched me. <laughs> He did. He punched me right in the mouth. And I never did that again. <laughs> we live in a culture that is feminized. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something, brothers. I was thinking about this this morning. There's sometimes that all a man understands is you better stop that. No, that's right. Or you got God to deal with. Yeah. You better come out of that. Or you got God to deal with. I'm going to just say something. So this is not, I want to talk about, some of you know what miracle Victor was coming up here. I hope you don't mind me. Victor Rodriguez, to think that he would be at this men's conference a year ago and have an encounter with God like he's had where all I've heard out of his mouth is I'm going to make up to my wife what I've done. That's all I've heard from him. I, I, and, 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 and I'm going to make up to my family. That's, that's an encounter with God. Yeah. And I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters, I'm just tell, telling you something. Those things are miracles. Yeah. And I agree with Pastor Pam. The Bible says, I believe this Bible says the last day of revival will start with men. Yeah. Turning back to their families. Saying, I need to go home. I need to be a father. I need to be a godly man. I need to take responsibility for where my family is. I need to take responsibility for where my marriage is. I need to get on my face before God and pray this thing back to where it's supposed to be. And be a man of the closet, right? Come on. Be a man of the closet. And same with women. Be a woman of the closet. Turn off Facebook. Turn off the computer. Get away from the TV. Come on. Number two, the nest is a place of emotional purity. We talked about moral purity. I want to talk about emotional purity. Hannah is a type of emotional purity. Before God would allow Samuel to be birthed in here, the Bible says that God had to get her to an altar where she let go. She let go of her anger and her bitterness. God couldn't birth anything through that spirit. <coughs> This needs to be a place of emo listen to me, church, of emotional purity. Will you listen? You, you, you don't understand God. God in heaven was saying this, uh, Hannah, I want to do something through you, but I will, I will not birth, a, I will not put a child in that womb. Yeah. Not with your attitude. Not with that bitterness. You would infect him. You would, you would do something wrong in him. You would produce something that would be harmful to him and to everybody else he would ever come in contact with. Can you understand that? Listen, I'm telling you that your emotional life can be a barrier to what God wants to do through you. I, I understand that life can do some painful things. But I'll tell you something, you and I have a choice. We have a choice whether we're going to hold on to that or whether we're going to let go of it. I told you this a couple of weeks ago. I was talking to Pastor Jeff Eklund. And he had a couple in his office. And he said, I'm, I'm counseling with them. And he said, they don't go to my church and but they had asked to come and counsel with me. I'm counseling with them, and they start talking about an affair. And they start talking about how the, the man had had an affair, and the woman he'd had an affair with had a venereal disease, and he gave the venereal disease to his wife. And he said, and the, and the atmosphere got really tense, and it was really uncomfortable. And he said, and I asked, I said, he said, how long ago did this happen? And the man said, 20 years ago. And Jeff said, what? 
She said, he said 20 years ago. And he said, 20 years ago? He said, I leaned over my desk, I grabbed the edge of the desk, and I said, 20 years ago? <laughs> but things get caught in your spirit. Things get, listen, I went, to, I went through a, a, a situation recently that I had to get before God and say, Father, if you don't get this out of my spirit, it will affect everything you wanted to do through my life. I've got to let go of this. I've got, to get, I've got to let go of this. Listen, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about moral purity. Everybody goes, that's right. But what about emotional purity? What about when I'm holding offense or I'm holding unforgiveness? I'm holding things in my heart. Listen, there's got to be emotional purity in this house. Or I've, got to get, I've got to get through some things that have happened to me. Otherwise, listen, you can't, you, you become passive aggressive. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. It'll affect your counsel. It'll affect everything you do in your life. Lastly, there's got to be motivational purity. Abraham, there's got to be a motivation in this house. We have one motive, and that is to raise evils. Not, not, not a motive for position, title, see me, notice me, platform. It's got to be one motive. Producing eagles. Amen. The motive, listen, the motive, I haven't got into the meat of this. The motive of that mom and dad is one thing. The nest is about one thing. Raising eagles. That's their whole life. Church, church has become about showing off. Church has become about my title and my position and whether or not I'm happy. And when you get your mind, your eyes off of the reason we are here. We are here to do one thing, one thing, one thing. We are here to produce eagles. Amen. Come on, Amen. are you with me? Amen. No, are you with me? Amen. If you're with me, I want you to stand. Come on. Every leader, it's about raising leaders. That picture we saw up on that overhead yes. of Shayla. Uh, of all the current students in Bruce House, her staying surprised me the most. Shayla was so emotionally undone when she came in. And, 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 and I mean, I, I mean, there were several points that she was going to leave and talked about leaving, and even one point where Cindy said, "Go ahead and leave." And you left twice. She left twice, yeah. but she came back, and there's the picture, wherever it was. But I'm going to tell you something. If you get your eyes on what we're about, everything else will lose its importance. You know, there's there's a see I'm 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 49, and there's a point in my life, even it's happening even now, where I'm moving from from player to coach. Come on now. I don't preach half as much as I used to. Yeah, and you know, I don't care about that. I real honestly, I don't. My whole my whole heart has been, I want to raise men of God. I want to raise men of God. I don't, my, my father was 72 years old when he died. He was 48 years old when I was born, so I had the age of a grandfather. I had as a father. My dad, he didn't know this. He didn't purpose. He just, just was who he was. And we would get in the car, and he, would, he took me to the USS Missouri, the battleship that for years was mothballed in Bremerton, and he took me to the place and had me stand at the place where the Japanese signed the surrender in World War II. My dad was a patriotic man. He loved America. Wherever we went, listen, it's popular in America to hate America now. It's weird. We live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth. You know, some of those people just want to punch in the mouth. But my dad would take me there and, and, and we, we would drive. You know, I, I think of this all the time when I read Deuteronomy. It says, when you're walking down the way, and my dad would either talk about Jesus or America. 
And we would be driving, and he would he would tell me how fortunate I was, and he he would always he would always I mean just it was who he was. And so you know something, I've lived a life where my greatest heartache. You can ask my wife. There's times it just puts me in a bad mood when I watch what's happening to America, and and, and I, I just my heart has been. That if God can raise up, see, I, what I've wanted to be, I wanted to be David Wilkerson. I wanted to be that man that snuck into the devil's camp and stole about fifty thousand men, and for his generation changed the world. In his lifetime, I was telling you the other day, Samuel Rodriguez got saved. One of the very men, Samuel Rodriguez, was standing on a street corner. In, in Brooklyn, New York, in a pouring rain, a heroin addict. David Wilkerson was had drove up to the stoplight and saw him on the on the other corner, and in a pouring rain, pulled up next to him and said, "You want to ride?" He said, "Sure." He gets in the car and they start driving, and he he asked Pastor David, "What, what do you do?" And Pastor David said, "I'm a pastor." He said, "I'm I'm a, I'm a heroin addict." And David said, "No." He said, you know, we've got a ministry called Teen Challenge. And Samuel Rodriguez gave his heart to Jesus and went in Teen Challenge. And today, Samuel Rodriguez is the head over 10,000 churches. Ten, did you hear me? 10,000 churches. Church, I'm going to tell you, you know, what is the, you know why a lot of Christians are so depressed? Because they don't do anything. They're not involved in anything. I'm telling you the most exciting thing in the world is watching a young man or a young woman begin to grow and, and, and get free and, and your whole life changes. We've been through, Sid and I have been through so many difficult times. Hard times. But you watch somebody walk up an, old, walk up an aisle and give their life to Jesus yeah. and watch the Holy Ghost yeah. and just like yeah. awesome. every, every battle you ever had just floats away. I think yeah. that's, that's what it's about. I want to talk about, I probably should stop right there, but I'm not going to. And, uh, I'm just, I'm just about that. I want to talk about the provision of the nest. We've talked about the environment of the nest. I want to talk about the provision. I'm talking about food. Do you know that while, while uh, the eaglets are growing, that the mom and the dad eagle, they never leave them alone, but the whole time they're growing, that all they do, day in and day out, day in and day out, is leave the nest and look for food. Leave the nest and look, come back. And they feed out of their mouth. They feed these chicks. They open their mouth and they feed out of their mouth. So I'm going to tell you something. <clears throat> Every leader in this house needs to understand this. You and I had better be searching for food, leaders. Amen. For a time, we feed people out of what we feed on. There's a point that people have to feed themselves, but for a time, listen, you should not stand behind this holy desk unless you have a word. Yeah. And I'm not talking about putting pressure on yourself. I'm just saying we cannot afford to get into a place where we're getting service from the internet, or we're getting service because we heard it on the radio or on TV. Listen, I need to be before the Father. I have a responsibility, and so does every leader in this house. We gotta take that deadly serious. Because they feed out of our mouth. New, new believers feed out of our mouth. It's powerful. That mother eagle, now I'm gonna tell you something. You, you know what motivates? Uh, there's something I'm gonna get into. You, you know what motivates a mother and a, and a father eagle to conquer? You know what motivates them? They're chicks. That's what motivates them. Uh, an eagle is the champion of the sky. It's got no mortal enemies. It's the lion of the sky. That's what it is. But what motivates an eagle, this is good, what motivates an eagle to conquer is to feed. You know what should motivate you? To conquer your personal enemies? Because you got people to feed. Amen. Man, this is good stuff. I don't know about it. I got to shout about it. Preacher. Amen. This, this guy... 
Pastor Jesus, he stole, uh, I think he's been listening to my sermons. <laughs> he talked about how that the bear and the lion were private wars. The wars you have to win in your private life. And nobody, there's no, he, this exactly, he said the same thing I said. He said, there's no stage. There's no audience. The only people that will ever know about that battle that you could allow to go on, but you won't, is you and God. How many know that God is zeroed in on what nobody knows about you? What motivates an eagle, you know what, listen, what motivates me to conquer is because I've got children, I've got grandchildren, I've got a wife. Listen to this, do you know that, that, you know that eagles are fiercely, fiercely defensive of the nest? They never even allow an enemy, if they can, they never allow anything to even get close to the nest. They fight it off in the distance. You see, leaders are to fight things off in the spirit before they ever have an opportunity to come close. Come on! Amen. It's true. We ought to be fighting leaders. We ought to be fighting things in the spirit. Amen. We ought to be fighting things. Come on, Trace. We ought to be fighting things in the spirit before they ever get close to our nest. Fighting things off before they ever get close to your family. Before they ever get close. Glory to God. That's so good. That is good. That's exciting. That is exciting me. You ever have to have your responsibility reawaken? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Yeah. I had to have, you know, I've heard women say that they think a godly man is sexy. I want my wife to think I'm sexy. Because I'm godly. Because I'm a godly man. Come on. Ladies, right? Come on, ladies. Is, 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 is a godly man attractive? So I'm going to tell you something. This is pretty, this is pretty powerful. So you know how an eagle wars? I'm going to... I've got a minute. You know, yeah. you know how an eagle wars? See, an eagle fights its fight. This is good stuff. Do you know that an eagle, an adult, eagles are majestic. I, I watch them all the time when I walk. And by the way, i got to say this. This guy reminded me of you, Bruce. This man that was preaching. He reminded me of you. Anyway, I watch these eagles all the time when, when I'm walking. And do you know that an adult eagle has been, listen, this is unbelievable, has been known to carry something off almost 50 pounds. Oh, yeah. Gra grabs it with its, with its claws and carries something off. You know what that's saying? They're a giant killer. They don't know the size of something. So I can't. I can't. I can't defeat that. I, I don't, does anybody? Does that pump anybody else? Up? You know what they do? They will grab a snake and they will they will carry it up way high in the sky over rocks and drop it. Yeah, they do. That's how they kill them. You know what that's saying? You and I need to fight the right fight. We carry things to the Father. Stand with me. I'm going to get into one thing uh, next week. Praise the Lord. We're going to get into more of the food of eagles next time. <laughs> Father, I just come before you. I ask in the name of Jesus that you move in this place this morning. 
I pray for the conviction of the Holy Ghost. No matter how old or young we are, I pray for parents. I pray for grandparents. I pray for fathers. I pray for mothers. I pray for young people. Father, I pray for people that are that are tired of being assaulted. They're tired of being victimized. They're ready for the nest. They're ready to let you, Father, be a part of their life. I want to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed in this place, nobody looking around, if there's anybody here this morning that would say, Pastor, I have never made Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to do that this morning. I want to invite Jesus into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. That doesn't mean you're joining anything. It just means you're inviting the Lord of glory into your heart, into your life. Would you raise a hand if that's you? I will not embarrass you, I promise. If that's you, raise a hand. Are there people here this morning, you're a believer. You're a believer. But you're in captivity. There's captivity in your life. There's something that is holding you captive. And you want to be free. Maybe you're here and you have not been, you're a believer, and you've not been very responsible with your own life or with what God has called you to do. Maybe you, maybe in your heart you've been running from the call. There's a call on your life. There's, there's a pull of the Holy Ghost in your life, and you've been running from it. And this morning, you, there's something in you that says, I, I, I want to yield to this. I need to allow God into this area of my life. Would you raise a hand up if that's you? There are people here this morning. Listen, I believe this with all my heart. I believe, I, I don't think we're perfect. I don't think we're perfect, but I do think this is a nest. This church is a nest where we want to, we want God to use us. I believe there are leaders here that have anointing on their life, yoke-breaking anointing on their life. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I need to be prayed for. I need God to, I need God to move in my life. I need God to move and set in an area of my life. Would you raise a hand up? I believe there's a yoke-breaking anointing in this place among, on a lot of our leadership. I want to do something this morning. I've seen this in my heart all morning long. So I'm going to do this. I, I want, I want, if you went to men's conference, and you want to pray for people, I want you to come. Guys, if you, if, 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 if you went to men's conference and you want to pray over other people, I just want you to come. Listen, some of these guys are, are really, really young, but I'll tell you something, God used young people all the way through the Word of God. I want you to come if you need prayer. I want you to come. I want you to let one of these lay them hand, their hands on you. I want our elders and our deacons to come in behind the people that are coming for prayer. And would you, leadership, would you come up? Listen, if you're here this morning and you need something broken on your life, you need something done in your life, you need God to do something in your life, come on. Come on. There, The Spirit of the Lord has been in this house all morning. You need something done in your family. You need something done in your marriage. Maybe you're debating. You're, you're debating being loyal. You need God to do something in your family. Maybe your spouse is not where they need to be with Jesus and you're concerned. Maybe it's your child. Maybe it's your grandchild. Listen, don't miss this moment. The Spirit of God has been in this house all morning. Come on, let, let the Spirit of God minister to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.